Hey, Thorsten. Um, can you share your uh, screen? Uh, I believe that's what I'm doing. Ah, uh, there it is. <laughs> it, it might just not pop up because I didn't say anything. <laughs> Could be the yep. magic. There it is. <laughs> um. yeah, but uh, then, uh, obviously, people can hear me, so I wait another minute then and perhaps start. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay, so it's half past the hour. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to uh, my talk about LibreOffice in your browser. Maybe not the usual uh, talk about that. Um, it's about WebAssembly and uh, a number of other new tags to perhaps make that happen in a different way. Um, I work for CIB, um, glad to be here today. Uh, my name is Thorsten Behrens, um, since CIB, uh, with CIB since 2015, I've been building the LibreOffice team there, and actually one of those um, naughty people who founded and port LibreOffice and then founded TDF, and I've been working uh, with that code base, which was open office before since 2001 um, I'm actually developing the code and um, various other things um, and I'm a hacker computer scientist and fighting and rooting for open source and open standards uh, whenever I get the occasion um, good so what's this all about um, the state of the art that's what we have and obviously you're scratching your head and asking so you already have LibreOffice in the brow browser what's the point um, so let let me get to that in a second <laughs> first of all uh, where are we today um, state of the art um, what we have is an HTML5 canvas based um, browser version of LibreOffice uh, which is lightweight on, on the browser side on the client side using tiled rendering like a map skewer and all the heavy lifting actually happens on the server so all documents of all users running on this instance have to be loaded there and all rendering and also all editing has to happen in the data center so that's essentially like a uh, like terminal server like application virtualization in a data center essentially from a 10,000 feet perspective. That's that's how that works. And um, there's a number of websites. Um, it's really quite light on the client, both in terms of uh, the amount of JavaScript you need to download, but also in terms of uh, processing on the client side. The documents uh, never leave your data center, so they stay there. It's just the, the view or, or the some rendered down um, pixel version of the document that leaves your data center that you can then take any number of measures to make sure that if that's leaked by a screenshot at least you know uh, who that was by embedding some watermarks for example uh, and it makes collaborative editing uh, quite easy um, because you simply only have one instance of your document and unless you run into scalability issues because you have I don't know, 500 users editing on the same document uh, and this is all kind of single, essentially single-threaded uh, writer core there. Um, it's essentially just routing multiple inputs until multiple cursor positions and then sending the resulting document uh, updates back. Um, the cons are um, 
Well, there is no offline mode, obviously, because you're always there is no document on your client, uh, and whenever you scroll, zoom, uh, edit um, them or somebody else edits, then you need an update over the wire. Um, it's quite expensive to host in comparison, and there's nothing like peer-to-peer -peer editing or end-to-end -end encryption possible between um, between two clients or any number of clients. So you always need a version of the document and that is necessarily uh, not encrypted, loaded on the server. Um, right, so um, pricing and total cost of ownership for, for LibreOffice Online. So um, th that's, that's what I was um, referring to with this um, expensive to host. Um, there is, if, if you if you want to, like if you look at those hyperscalers, um, they um, they work because their the cost of, of running anything is essentially um, handed over to the client. So, so the the running the, the stuff in the data center per user, the, the cost is extremely low. Otherwise, it wouldn't scale. And for for LibreOffice Online, as it is now. Um, the, there's cost of licensing, obviously, and support, and it's um, strongly recommended, actually, that you, um, if you run LibreOffice Online professionally, that you do get uh, support and, uh, and a license, uh, because you will be more happy and your users will be more happy, and uh, also uh, LibreOffice and the uh, ecosystem around LibreOffice will be more happy. Um, but there's also the cost of operation. So you need staff, you need maintenance, uh, you need user support. Um, those can presumably be kept pretty low by simply not doing that or um, just uh, trying to push that as low as possible so that it becomes economic, economically viable. Mm, the cost of hosting, mm, that's probably something that will also go down over time, but it's something that you really can't tweak by much. So real-world needs, per, which is always actively working, with also somebody who's, who's typing or scrolling. Um, that's two to, per, two to three active users per CPU thread um, in, in, in our experience. And you need about 100 megabytes um, because uh, yeah, people, unless they work on very, very simple documents, but anything that is impress slides or, or color sheets that is that more trivial, it's easily that. So on average, you have that 100 megabyte, which is kind of the same order of magnitude, plus or minus. I mean, there's, there's a constant factor, obviously, but same order of magnitude is like right now, virtualization. So that turns into around 50 to 100 US dollars per average active user in here, which is slice and support. And dominating that is actually your um, uh, AWS bill, because that's what uh, mostly compute costs you on that um, order of magnitude. Um, okay, so then drilling down a bit more or putting the finger into that um, um, topic a bit more. So pain points, that, that and, and that's actually why, why you don't see this widespread adoption. It's not that everyone's using free versions of the office. Uh, Hosting free versions of LibreOffice Online, like you find that for for Jitsi, Etherpad, other things, but are which are just just an order of magnitude ah. cheaper to host. And for LibreOffice Online, it's it's actually can be uh, ruinous if you suddenly have uh, I don't know hundreds of thousands of users using that. So price of hosting and price of hosting and um, actually price of hosting. Um, so. Just to put this into perspective, um, advertising base, this RPU is average revenue per user, uh, industry average for something that is advertised, advertising business is like less than half, a, less than 50 cent per year. And for Facebook, which is really the, the king of the castle, which, which is like the, the, the industry benchmark for extracting lots of value, the user that's but more than seven US dollars per year. So, so you have to have users that do very, very little 
editing to, to make that a viable business. So, yeah, what is that? Um, uh, what is it? It says like, um, oh yeah, and also, um, well, the <laughs> there's no offline mode and there's some bandwidth and latency requirements, um, which you, it's arguable. I mean, if you're offline today, yeah, there's probably many other things that you cannot do. Um, but obviously, latency sucks, if, uh, which happens especially in mobile networks if you can't if you frequently can't do things or uh, the reaction of the, the application is slow. Yeah, so what now? Um, well, um, how about WebAssembly? So LibreOffice WebAssembly instead of LOL, LWA. Um, so looking at the um, trajectories of hardware, it's pretty obvious and kind of flogging a dead horse that, that the, on the client side, on the edge, like uh, outside the data center, it's like it's still Moore's law. So the phones were up to eight cores, more than two gigahertz, 12 gigabyte of RAM in the high end, same story with ultra books. And so, so just it's a pretty safe bet that, that what three years, five years ago you had on, on, a, on a low powered uh, laptop tend to have on your mobile device or your mobile phone. So, so just not using that power and memory on the client side sounds a bit like a waste. Um, so why not do what we did uh, even before 2000 in, during Star Division times, which is port the bloody thing to a new architecture. How hard can it be? Uh, there's been, um, I don't know, the number of ports, like really Porting to new architecture that must be like order of magnitude 10, um, as it's just a new platform, the browser. And with WebAssembly, uh, there's a standard now uh, since end of 2019 um, for running native code in the browser. There's a scripting story that's been much older, but it's now actually there, standardized, available in all modern browsers, and the feature set is actually sufficient for what we need. And why do we do that? Well, as always, we use the core code. Um, that, that's what we need. We need the writer and the calc and the impress core and, and the model and the filters to do that on a client. And we cross-compile that to WebAssembly. And as we cross-compile to many other platforms like Android, iOS, Windows ARM, etc., etc. And at the same time, that's, that's the other part of the porting uh, effort. Use platform APIs wherever feasible, um, as we do that for, for other native platforms, where we use the, the, the native file store for Android and iOS. We use networking APIs there. Uh, we use, obviously, we use native APIs for Linux and Windows. Um, yeah. So, um, right. Um, actually, um, this is an announcement. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do um, in, in the next perhaps year or so. Um, hoping to start next month. Um, there's some bits and pieces missing. It's not, not exclusively my, my own decision here. Um, but that's the plan uh, with getting a crossbow going. And by the end of the year, probably latest for Foster next year. However, wherever that happens, looks like virtual likely, um, have first pixel rendered. So actually not only compiling, but also running. And by summer next year, um, being able to edit text and writer, likely not um, script down, likely not like super, super polished compute, but having a minimum viable product for writer with end-to-end uh, -end encryption editing of documents uh, within one year. That's uh, the goal. And um, how to do that in detail? Um, so, well, actually, we started playing with that in uh, 2015 uh, and then gave it up um, because it was just not ready. Um, and 
couldn't even do exceptions properly. Well, it could, but it was terribly emulated. It came at a horrible price, like two, three times the size and uh, ten times slower. Um, now stars are aligned. So we have the W3C standard, we have, we have browser support. Nothing is really missing, except perhaps threading, which is uh, which is uh, um, not standardized. Well, there, there's prototypes in, in, in Chrome and other browsers, but it's not, let's say, final. And also, we know the market. So there's demand for that, um, obviously. And what it's doing, um, well, First, we need to get a cross-building, which is a bit of nitty-gritty uh, make file working, and um, perhaps a little bit of, you know, bridge. But I, I think we don't need that for at least for the first, for the first um, release, uh, as there's no, no external, uh, you know, uh, API or anything um, useful in the browser. Uh, so we need four bl blobs uh, of code to use browser APIs, um, NSS, for example. And beyond that, strip down the monolith um, as we only want this target writer uh, for a start. Um, challenges. Um, yes, first and foremost, size of the binary. Um, if you look at what um, the, the mobile apps, which are also uh, uh, monolithic kind of only the stuff that you need to run uh, that, no, no, no extras, that's 100 megabytes. WebAssembly compiles down a bit into uh, uh, something that's more than uh, x64, uh, but still I don't think loading hundreds of megabytes in a browser is a good idea and will, will work out there. So we need to cut this down significantly. significantly. Uh, it has to be single-threaded. Um, as I said, multi-threading is not there yet for the mainstream. On the other hand, writer is single-threaded since 1990, so, so that's essentially cooperative multitasking, multi-threading. So it, it, it's a single thread, and if you need to do something in parallel, you send yourself a message or set up a timer, uh, and then um, yield, and then the timer at some stage comes and does what you want it. Um, so, so that's also not, not a blocker or, or a fundamental problem. There's lots of uh, multi-threading in LibreOffice, in Clipboard, in, uh, in uh, the Uno bridges. Um, uh, optional multi-threading uh, in, in tons of places, but that's optional. That's not, not required to have it there, like rendering, like um, loading, like uh, calc formula engine. Um, and also the heap size is an issue, so we only have right now a 2 gigabyte max with the current memory model, so we really need to put LibreOffice on a diet, um, which is probably a good, good idea anyway, <laughs> to look a bit like where, where the waste is and, and cut it out. Um, right, so this is almost all I wanted to say on that topic, just some miscellaneous notes. So this is pure play open source. It's not going to be in any separate repository. It's all going to happen in core and on master. Um, that will likely over time grow some JavaScript GUI code um, just to make it nice and and shiny and, and blend in uh, with, uh, with browser uh, GUIs. Uh, but that's going to be all below core, like for example the Android port uh, curious already. So, so that's essentially a port of LibreOffice core, and therefore everything we do there is going to be in core. Okay, that was that. <laughs> um, and now, thanks for your attention, and um, maybe we have some questions. Anybody have questions? Well, thank you, Thorsten. Appreciate the, the time.
um, in your presentation. Um, next step, we'll have um, document foundation uh, toolkit, OD, sorry, ODF uh, toolkit um, from Svente. And that should be in about 10 minutes or so. Again, thank you. Yeah, thanks uh, for your, for your attention. And um, yeah, you know where to where to reach me. I'm gonna sit on uh, Telegram and RSC, and just to read that from the from the chat. Fostum is gonna be virtual first weekend, Saturday, Sunday, as always in February 2021. So see you there later. <laughs> thanks, everyone.
Ma hai parlato con Joss? Ma ti ha dato la stessa impressione anche a te? Eh? 